apostles, what uh, converts are to the church today. Paul brought a new paradigm, uh, a, n a new honor, a new respect, a new appreciation uh, for the faith to the apostles. And converts today oftentimes bring to the church a new honor, a new respect, and a newfound appreciation uh, for the faith, uh, and they enrich the faith. Paul was saying to the early Christian community and to the apostles that the message of Christ is so great, it's for everybody. It's not just for this location, it's for everyone. Much like uh, what we should be saying in the church today, we shouldn't be saying that the faith is just for the Greeks or just for the Russians. It's for America, it's for everyone, it's for the whole world. St. Paul was born in 3 AD to a strict Pharisee parents in Tarsus, which is the capital city of uh, Cilicia, which is uh, near Asia Minor, and uh, which is the present day Turkey. His family was descended from the tribe of Benjamin. St. Paul studied with his parents until the age of 10. These were accomplished individuals. Uh, and then went to the schools in Jerusalem, where he learned about the Hebraic law, where he learned uh, about Moses, where he learned about uh, the prophets of the Old Testament, where he became uh, a teacher of the law, where he was able finally through the course of his education to rise to the position of Pharisee. The Pharisees were kind of like the lawyers of the day. They strictly monitored those who broke the uh, Jewish tradition of uh, dietary laws and so forth. And uh, for the most part, Pharisees who observed Jesus not strictly adhering to the law according to their interpretation, they were the ones who were riled up against him and turned against him and ultimately caused the, the crucifixion of Jesus. Paul was what they call a Shamite Pharisee. In the time of King Herod, there were two different types of Pharisees, two different types of groups. One was the Hillels and one was the Shamites. The Hillels were more of the lenient type of Pharisees who adhered sort of to the resurrection, had adhered to the Jewish law, but in a much more lenient sense, whereas the Shamites were very strict. But St. Paul even went that much further being a Shemite Pharisee, being more zealous than any of his brothers for the Torah and for the Mosaic Law. At the time in Jerusalem, the 12 disciples were still in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit had come upon them, but they were still organizing their preachings in Jerusalem itself. They had not gone out to preach to the world yet. And they were arrested and brought in front of the Sanhedrin. And Gamaliel, who was Saul's instructor stood there because he was part of the Sanhedrin and he told all of them including Saul do nothing to these men do not touch them or do any harm because I find nothing incorrect in their teachings and what they're saying they help people they do this they do that if these teachings that they're bringing forth are from man then they're gonna die out but if these teachings that they bring forth are from God, then you risk the chance of warring against God. And Saul did not listen to him. He still went out after these disciples, not realizing he was warring against God. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was blinded by his righteousness. In fact, um, whenever St. Paul could, he would, uh, he would arrest people, arrest Christians and throw them in jail. In fact, he went in private homes and he arrested Christians, threw them in jail. In fact, it was St. Paul that stood at approval at the stoning of a young Christian, which was, who was known as Stephen. The first one to ever martyr for Jesus Christ. It may have even been Paul. We don't have proof, but, but as the tradition states, it may have even been Paul who ordered the execution of St. Stephen, the first martyr to Jesus Christ. St. Paul persecuted Christians because he realized that these people who were not adhering to the Torah, that which he lived and died for, he felt if they were not following this law, that they were not, they didn't even deserve to live, not let alone even to just persecute them. He, he felt they deserved not even to live. Saul was the man, as they would say. Saul had petitioned the Sanhedrin, which is a ruling council of 71 Jews, in order to receive permission to, uh, um, to actually persecute more Christians. So in his zealousness, he says, where else can I go? So now he's going to Damascus to hunt down more uh, Christians to throw them in jail. On his road to Damascus, St. Paul was knocked down and blinded by the Lord, and he's, he heard a voice saying, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who is it? You, Lord? God had to blind him with light and calm him down a little bit so he could hear and listen to what was going on and then redirect the same energy 
but in the proper direction. And then he was instructed to go and to be baptized, to be washed by Ananias in Damascus. Ananias, who was a disciple of Christ, was told that this Saul of Tarsus was coming to him. This person who vehemently persecuted Christians, that was Christ was taking him to be an instrument of his word, to teach the people to be as zealous for he was for the Torah, to be that much more zealous for Christ and for his love. And then Ananias um, goes to Damascus. He finds Paul, who, had been, who was still blind because he'd been blind for three days and three nights. Um, he fasted from food and drink also for, the, for, the, for three days and three nights. And Aeneas heals his blindness and he baptizes him in that same moment. Scales, as it were, fell from his eyes and then he could see physically because he could see spiritually. Before he was blinded spiritually, but now he can see both physically and spiritually because the inner disease was cured and therefore he could truly see physically to do the will of God as it should be. When Paul was blinded on his road to Damascus, I think that's a reminder to all of us that oftentimes you really can't see until you are blinded. It was when he was blinded that was finally his opportunity. It was finally the time where he saw God and where he saw and received the Holy Spirit. When he had his conversion experience, he used the same energy, but instead of using it against Christianity, he used it for the benefit of the gospel. Instead of being Saul, the diligent, faithful, hardworking persecutor of Christians, Saul became Paul, the diligent, faithful, hardworking, committed preacher of the Word of God. After his conversion, when he came back and met with the disciples, told him, you cannot preach yet. What do you want me to do, he asked them. We want you to go back to Tarsus and stay there. And he goes, well, I'm ready to go out and preach. He had the zeal still to go out and preach. He didn't have the fear but he didn't know what to the extent it was. And when Paul was rejected by the disciples to go back to Tarsus and stay there and meditate, it wasn't because Peter and the other disciples didn't want him to preach, it's because for his own safety. Even as Peter said, you're no good to us dead, so go back to Tarsus and wait there until everything calms down, whatever, and then we will call upon you. In going out to the, to, to the known world to proselytize, sometime he had to be reeled in by the apostles his enthusiasm, his zeal, being an incredible zealot for the, for the love of Jesus Christ. We've got 12 apostles. These are the people that were directly in contact with Jesus. And here comes this individual who hunted down Christians and killed them with a pleasure, a perverted pleasure. And he wants to be a member of this group? Obviously, they would look at him and say, we don't think you qualify for this kind of job and certainly not to be in our group. So there was a clash. After Judas hanged himself, the 11 remaining disciples uh, came together to elect a successor to Judas. Through Lot, they chose Matthias. And it's very interesting in the church that uh, Matthias is never pictured uh, with the 12 in the icons of the Pentecost and is not commonly considered one of the 12. It was Paul who's now uh, become the 12th. And uh, Paul was specifically chosen by God, not by the 11. Uh, disciples but by God. So that creates an unusual situation that Paul is an outsider uh, to the apostles. At one point there was great controversy between Peter and Paul. Peter felt that Christianity should be brought only to the Jews. Paul chastised Peter because Peter refused to sit and eat unclean meat with Gentiles, individuals that Paul was trying to convert and bring them into the Christian faith. And Paul told Peter, what you're doing is wrong. We need to bring them to the table with us to eat and to drink, to understand that we are people like they are and that we're bringing a great message of great joy to them. You cannot forget that at the time of when the establishment of the Mosaic Law was, God established rules and regulations for the Jewish people. He said, this is what you must eat, this is what you must not eat. And it's in the Old Testament what to eat, what not to eat. But it was done for a reason for that part because he himself wanted to make these chosen people of his separate from the issue of what the Gentiles were. That was the Old Testament. But now with the New Testament and reality of going forth, this coming of the Son, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, now the church has to embrace these people, these groups, 
so salvation can come in. One day, Peter had a vision, as it described in the book of Acts, when he was hungry and he saw a large sheet descend from heaven with all of the animals on it. And the voice told Peter, eat. Well, there were some animals there that were considered by Jewish definition to be unclean. And Peter rejected it three times saying, I will not eat the blood, the food of the blood of the animals. And the voice said to him, I have not created anything that is unclean. And Peter suddenly realized that this was a message to him that all of the peoples belong to God and that the gospel could be presented to all and not to the Jews only. And he came back and he accepted Paul's understanding that the gospel should go to all nations. It must have been very difficult for the apostles because they were taught by Jesus Christ. They lived with him, they saw, they experienced. And yet this person who was on the opposite end of the spectrum, who was, who was persecuting Christians at the time of Christ, all of a sudden now had leaped beyond them in the proselytizing of the faith. And I believe it's important to step back a second and think about the reconciliation, uh, uh, how difficult that must have been for St. Peter, uh, how difficult it must have been for St. Paul himself to come together with the apostles and say, look, we have our differences, our differences of approach. It happens today in church circles every single day. We have our differences, but that's because God has given us different talents. And I think when they, when they sat together, even though it's not written, when they sat together, they realized how important it was to really follow Christ and to forgive each other and to allow each other to take the potential that they have and to use it for the master, for the message, for the gospel, for the end result. And that's the significant part of it. Not that they, that they were conflicting, but they were able to come back and rec reconcile with each other and be loving with each other. That's why you see the icon many times of Peter and Paul embracing each other and kissing each other on the cheek. After reconciling approach with the apostles, Paul began a 30-year ministry that is second to none. St. Paul basically undertook three missionary journeys throughout his lifetime. And with these three missions that were in his life, he was going to establish the churches in the entire Roman Empire. Visited many different places from Corinth to Thessalonica to Athens, even up to um, Rome. He traveled many different places um, to be able to spread the good word. And at that time, he already he ordained women as, as deaconesses. Paul did ordain deaconesses along to help him with his ministry in order to help continue establish the church and to show that he is not biased toward men or women. The deaconesses and everyone that um, travel with, with Paul on these missionary journeys helped greatly. During his missionary work, he suffered tremendously. He was imprisoned for one two-year stretch, a whole two years. He almost lost his life at sea. He was continuously being challenged and he still had to make his living. When you look at all the hurdles that Paul had to go through in order to lead men to Christ, we also read in the scriptures that uh, um, Christ or God makes it rain on the righteous and the unrighteous and he doesn't give us any more than we can handle. He, in his infinite wisdom, he knew that Paul could handle all the beatings, all the stonings, all the cold, all the travel. In one of his writings he said that he had the right as an apostle to expect that the people would take care of him but he felt obligated to earn his living and he continued doing his own work so that he could feed himself in addition to unlimited energy to spread the gospel. Paul was a hands-on person. He had to be there with, even though he wrote letters, he had to be there with his people. He had to show his apostles, the people that he left in charge of these churches, through his example, exactly how to minister to people, exactly what to teach people to make sure that Christ's teachings would remain pure and direct. He went to those places, gave of himself. As St. Paul was traveling to these various areas to continue to preach the gospel, he began writing his letters to different communities, offering them how they should live their lives, how they should change the lives where they were now that they've accepted Christ. As we email each other today, he wrote to them with his hand 
and communicated with them to tell them what to do, how to be proper Christians. And ultimately, these letters, which really were instructional letters and greeting letters too, became known as the epistles of St. Paul in the Bible of the New Testament. Fourteen letters in the New Testament reflect the churches that Paul established and the, the visits he made to them. If you look through Paul's 14 epistles that he wrote, some of them are so powerful and uh, some passages are, are more powerful than any. Like, for example, his, his, his passage on love, it's so powerful, it's so passionate that it's used in wedding services, it's quoted throughout history, and uh, actually Paul wrote that to the Corinthians. And the reason why he wrote this passage on love to the Corinthians is that the Corinthians were doing something, they weren't loving one another. They weren't expressing the love, the Christ-like love, the way we know it should be expressed. So Paul wrote to them and he answered them and he says, wait a second guys, love is patient, love is kind, love is eternal. Paul really wasn't welcomed in all places that he preached the gospel. In one instance, Paul went to uh, um, Paul went with Silas to to Philippi on one of his his missionary journeys to preach the gospel. And uh, following him during this uh, missionary journey in Philippi was a uh, was a slave girl. And Scripture says that she had a spirit of deviation, and she also told fortunes. And actually, that's how she made her her money for the slave owners by, by telling their fortunes. And she continually came to St. Paul. And St. Paul became agitated and he turned and he said to the spirit, come out of her. And the spirit, the demons were removed from this young girl. And well, actually the, the spirit of deviation was gone, but unfortunately so was the, uh, the spirit of uh, fortune telling. So now it got back to her slave owners that uh, she could no longer tell fortunes, so she could not make no longer make money for them. The people that were making money from her powers were extremely angry about this and arranged for Paul to be imprisoned. And Paul spent some time in prison. He was praying and an angel appeared to him and suddenly the chains were taken free from his body and the door of the prison was opened and he began to leave. And the guard of the prison saw what had happened and he was alarmed that he was going to be punished for letting Paul go. The jailer was ready to commit suicide and right before he stabbed himself, Paul said, no, 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 it's not you, it's, uh, it's by the miracle of God that uh, I was able to be released from prison. And now the jailer, who had witnessed everything, he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, well, all you have to do is, is repent and believe in God. He was so overtaken by the miracle of how Paul was freed that he converted to Christianity. Paul ended up in, in Jerusalem um, on one of his missionary journeys and the Jews actually dragged him out of the temple and started beating him. Well, the Roman commander saw this and wanted to put an end to it, so he figured that he would arrest him and throw him in jail. Paul was brought before the Sanhedrin who had secretly tried to plotted to kill him. It's interesting to note that the same Sandrin that Saint Paul had approached St. Paul about persecuting those Christians in Damascus, that same Sandrin had him on persecution on account of his own life. Paul was tried and even though he was going to be cast aside just like any one of the Christians, uh, they soon realized that this was a Roman citizen and a Roman citizen had certain rights. The Jews could not beat him or kill him because he was a Roman citizen. He was accountable under Roman law, not Jewish law. And he requested that he go in front of Caesar Agrippa in order to hear his case. Paul presented his case before Caesar and he was acquitted of all charges. He spent the next two years in Rome preaching the word of God. At that time, Nero was arresting all Christians because he thought Christians were guilty of setting fire to Rome. Nero conveniently um, blamed the fires of Rome, the burning of Rome, on the Christians. Nero was nuts. He was, he was insane. Nero was, was a typical, fanatic, extremist, insane tyrant. For example, during the Olympic Games, he went to the Olympic Games and he played. He won every event because nobody dared 
to run against him. He played one of the Olympic Games and he won every event. I mean, what kind of a megalomania is that? He was just insane. Because Paul was such a leader, he had Paul beheaded. He had him um, uh, executed uh, to show that he was still in power and he was leading Rome and not the Christians. As Paul is being taken to his martyrdom, he meets a girl blinded in her right eye named Perpetua. And Paul says, give me your handkerchief. And so the girl hands him his handkerchief. As Paul is martyred, as he is beheaded, the blood from his martyrdom get, is on the handkerchief. And the handkerchief appears in the hand of Perpetua. She rubs the blood of Paul in her eye and immediately her sight is restored to show that the, the blood of St. Paul and the ministry he led was truly that of Christ and everyone confessed, blessed is the God that Paul preached. It's ironic to note that Paul at his, his final event had ended up giving sight to someone just as he was given sight on his road to Damascus. In one of Paul's pastoral epistles to uh, Timothy, his fellow worker in the Lord, he states to him, uh, and this is toward the end of his life, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. And he basically says, uh, up in heaven the Lord has a crown of righteousness, not only for me, but all those who love me and love the Lord and love my coming. And if you look at this man, St. Paul, he basically wrote this toward the end of his life, late 50s, early 60s, and through everything that he went through in his life, all the tortures, all the beatings, all the times that he thought be killed, all the narrow escapes of death, that he was homeless for a while, that he was destitute, that he had, uh, he walked in cold, he walked in desert. Paul never gave up. Paul gave it 100%. And at the end of his life, he was satisfied with that. So that really tells us, and we really take great comfort in Paul in that whatever you do in your life, especially in our Christian walk, if you give it your all, if you try your best, if you give it 100%, then at the end of the day, or more or less at the, at, the, at the awesome seat of judgments, you can rest assured and you can tell Christ, Christ, I gave him my all. I did what I could. I fought the good fight. I kept the faith.